bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us here as family this morning. We're just so grateful to you for all the grace you've given us over the years, and particularly this morning as we continue to learn this beautiful book, this book of Hebrews. Father, we're just so blessed to be able to be here and partake, break bread together, the very bread of life, fellowship sweet fellowship, Father, that you've provided for us as a family to enjoy. Thank you. We do pray for those that aren't here with us physically to enjoy it. We pray for their return and your good timing, of course. We pray also for those that are still lost in this world, Father, without hope. We are most grateful and thankful, of course, for your son's work to cancel out that debt and to make times like this just times to sit back and relax, and rejoice, and be washed over. What an incredible blessing this is, Father. We do just ask for your blessings on this message as it's being taught, that it be edifying for our souls. We ask this in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Amen. All right, part three. The book of Hebrews. I'm still very excited about this journey we're embarking on. Uh, very uh, pleased and um, excited about where the Spirit's taking this congregation. Uh, last week was a wonderful way to kick off the series. Uh, as the Spirit pointed out, He's been preparing us for some time for this book study. If you look at the messages over the past few months, you see um, where he's been taking us as a congregation, and we covered some of that last time. Um, if you have ever spent any real time in the book of Hebrews, you know that it requires a bit of concentration. So if you just read it, you know, end to end, um, it's not the easiest read necessarily. There's a lot of Old Testament references and stuff like that, and some knowledge that's implied so that you can understand it better. Um, so it does require a bit of concentration. Uh, makes me think of the passage in chapter 6 that has been the center of a lot of controversy over the years, uh, but we'll get to that. Some people even use that chapter to say that you can lose your salvation, which is obviously a false doctrine. Um, but if you pull anything out of context, what have we learned? You can make scripture say anything you want if you pull it out of context. And so uh, that's one of the beautiful things we're going to see here. I was telling Tammy this yesterday that the study of this book and the way that he's got it set up is going to be awesome for all of you because it's not just going to be learning about this particular book, but it's also going to educate you on how to study for context. Like this will be an example of what it looks like to actually go into a book and say, okay, I really want to, you know, I really want to dig in. I really want to understand the, the context of what's being said here. So that exercise in this book will help you in a general sense. So that's another thing that I'm really excited about because that's how we're going to do it. Okay. Um, in brief, though, the theme from the pulpit as of late has been focus on our first love. Jesus Christ, of course, that's been the focus for months now. Focus on our first love, Jesus Christ. And as we'll continue to see, this is the very same encouragement that the writer of Hebrews was giving the congregation uh, when he wrote this beautiful book. Same type of encouragement. Don't lose your focus. Don't lose your first love. Last week, so we quickly perused scripture that amplified this point. Um, we did so by going to several passages throughout the book and taking note that the writer was constantly encouraging and supporting said encouragement with Old Testament references. So this is very typical of any teacher of the Bible. Um, you know, I know I do this. You make a point, but then you have to substantiate it. I'm going to do it this morning. You make a point, and then you go to other scripture to say, you see, this is what the Bible says about this particular point. Um, it's part of what we do. And if you look at the uh, book of Hebrews specifically, 
He just leans really heavily on the Pentateuch and Psalms, Old Testament books, right? Um, it, which implies something, which we'll see a little bit more on in a bit. So as we study out this book, we'll need to slow down, of course, but please don't forget these opening messages because the Spirit's setting the stage. So don't forget these opening messages, the importance of reading for context. Um, just as a side note, you know, maybe every so often you go back to the first part of this series or the first few parts of the series as we continue, because I imagine this series is going to be pretty lengthy. It's a good sized book, there's a lot to say, um, but every so often maybe you go back to part one or two and three or something like that just to get the big picture in view. Uh, with that said, we need to dig in some more. Um, now, again, in order to do this book justice, we've got to understand the context of the book. I think that is the key that, un that opens this entire book up. You have to understand the context. You cannot just read it out of context. You will be confused. So key questions must be answered, like, who's the writer? Who's the audience? What were the circumstances when the writer was compelled to write the book? When was the book written? What kind of book is it? In other words, what genre? Is it exposition? Is it narrative? Or is it a homily, a sermon? What was the purpose of the book? And then, of course, what theology and doctrine was used or expounded upon, et cetera, and so on and so forth. So those are all questions that really help you understand even one passage, one verse, one word. You have to understand what's the, what are all these things? Like I have to have a viewpoint. What are all these things? What's the context? So these are all fundamental elements of context. And the more you understand each of these things, and none of them are hard, that's the thing. As you'll see, none of this stuff is hard. You just got to do the labor. It's not, uh, you know, it's not like, oh man, you know, you're a pastor and you get this time to spend. And you go to the original, the blah blah blah. No, it's not like that. You'll see very quickly that anyone can do this thing. Okay, the more you understand each of these things that I just listed, the more likely you will understand the authors, the spirits, intended meeting. And that's what we're after. There's a writer who pens it, but it's the author's meaning we're after. So we're going to take our time with setting the context first. This book, as all others, of course, certainly demands it. So let's start with the writer. We're going to look at the writer up here on the board. I know this is an eye chart one, so I apologize, but I'll read it. Who wrote the book of Hebrews? Now here's the thing. There's no consensus among theologians on who wrote the book of Hebrews. You're like, oh, see? Right? You're like, already there's an unknown. It's not that important, as you'll see. In antiquity, uh, ancient times, right, arguments were made for Paul, Barnabas, Luke, and Clement of Rome. In recent times, Apollo, Silvanus, Philip the deacon, Priscilla, Aquila, together, Jude, Aristion, and others have been suggested. The writer is anonymous because we don't have enough evidence to dogmatically support any one candidate. So that's where we land. So right out of the gate, we know that we don't know who exactly it is. And you have to understand that God made it so. Maybe he, just maybe he said, I can't give you who it is because then you would think differently. I don't want you to know who it is. I just want you to know that this is the character, the nature, if you would, the purpose, the intended, or the intention of the writer. That's what I want you to know. So we're going to land there, first of all. The writer is anonymous to us. We don't know exactly who it is. But we know a lot about the writer, as we'll see. Based on this, we will simply be referring to the writer as the writer or the writer of Hebrews and so on and so forth okay but I won't ever purposely I may slip so forgive me 
but I won't purposely call him the author, simply because God is the author of the book. Okay, fair enough? Okay, so that's first point. Uh, and again, up here on the board, just to amplify that God is the author, 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17 reads, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Breathed out by God, up here on the board, next slide there, uh, Theonoustos, I think I've taught you this in the past, Theos is God, new is breath, it means giving or given by inspiration of God, divinely breathed. So all scripture is actually given by God. Different personalities pen it. He uses us just like he uses us to, you know, he uses different personalities to evangelize people, right? But he's the author of the gospel. He's, it's his spirit that actually regenerates an individual. So we're not the actual saviors, but he uses our personality. It's the same thing. He uses certain instruments, human instruments, to fulfill his will. And that's what he did here with the book of Hebrews. And that's what he's done with the entire Bible because it says all scripture is breathed out by God. Theonoustos, right? God breathed, if you want to say it that way. So this simple truth should help you accept the fact that we simply don't know who penned Hebrews. In fact... In terms of establishing authenticity of truth, in other words, the veracity of the book, it doesn't necessarily matter who penned Hebrews, strictly speaking, when we know for sure who the author is. We know for sure who's the author of Hebrews. God. Who penned it? I don't know. But God's the author. The good news is that we can derive a picture of the writer through inference in the book itself. So we're going to do that to see where that takes us. Okay? Again, we're just this morning is completely dedicated. Who was the writer of the book of Hebrews? That's this morning's message. The entire message dedicated just to that one thing. So that you understand who this person was. Okay? So let's see, well, let's do that and see where that takes us again. Uh, the first question is did the writer know his audience? Let me ask you a quick question on that front. If you were to write a letter to someone and you knew them, and then you had to write another letter the same day, but to someone you didn't know, would they be different? Of course. Would the first one possibly be a shorter letter? Maybe. If you're trying to explain something to someone, maybe you understand everything that they already know through a relationship. Maybe you understand, you know, what they understand. So you can write a letter a little bit differently to that person versus maybe a longer letter to make sure you don't miss anything, dot all your I's and cross all your T's and all that, you know, to somebody you don't know. So the first question is, did the writer know his audience? Go to Hebrews 13:19. Hebrews 13, 19. This is a very important question to ask. Did the writer know his audience? Well, we can find that from Scripture pretty quickly. Hebrews 13, 19 says, I, the writer, urge you the more earnestly to do this in order that I may be restored to you the sooner. Okay? By definition, restoration implies going back to something prior. Fair enough? All right. So up here on the board, the writer of Hebrews, he was known to his audience. They knew each other. And when we get into the thick of it, you're going to see the language that he uses, so on and so forth. It's very obvious that this particular pastor is writing to a congregation that knew him, that he was intimate with, spent time with, was hoping to be restored to, right? So he was known to his audience. We just read that verse 13, 19. And he was a man. 
He was a man, right? Verse 11.32, in terms of male versus female, go to Hebrews 11.32. So we have to just establish that, okay, so he knew his audience and he was a man. Hebrews 11.32 says, And what more shall I, the writer, say? For time would fail me, the writer, to tell, and now this Greek word, that uh, translates to tell, uses the masculine form, okay? Masculine form of Greek verb here, okay? So, for a time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and so on and so forth, right? The point is that it's a masculine form of the Greek verb and the subject, if you would, or the person performing that action, therefore, can be described as male. Does that make sense? So in the Greek, there is masculine, feminine usage of verbs. And if the subject, if you would, of that verb um, is male, then you see it in the verb itself. Okay? So that's just a little... Greek there for you. What we see in 1132 is that the writer uses the masculine form of a Greek verb to describe his own action. If it was a female, she would have used the female version of the verb. Okay, So that establishes his gender. So, so far, as we can see up on the board, he was known to his audience and he was a man. Let's see what else we can find out about the writer from the book itself. Go to Hebrews 13.22. Hebrews 13.22. Hebrews 13.22 reads, I appeal to you, brothers, bear with my word of exhortation, for I have written to you briefly. You should know that our brother Timothy has been released, with whom I shall see you if he comes soon. And so what you have here is this intimacy now with a broader group. Okay, The implication here is that Timothy, who used to run around with Paul, of course, is in view. And this writer was in this circle, so to speak. So what do we see up here in the board? Regarding the writer of Hebrews, he was part of what we might effectively call the Pauline circle. So as you can imagine, Paul had um, sort of, I don't want to call them satellites, but you know he was at the center of this movement back in the day. And he taught a lot of people, and a lot of people were his disciples. And so he had this sort of circle of friends, let's call it. And apparently this person was in that sort of orbit of Paul, right, and all of Paul's friends. And that's why he refers intimately to Timothy and speaks matter-of-factly about being a part of that circle, okay? So he was part of what might effectively, we might effectively call the Pauline circle. We just read that, verses 22 and 23 in chapter 13. He numbered himself among those who had heard the gospel from those who had heard it from Jesus Christ. So he's not saying that he heard it directly from Jesus Christ. Okay? He's sort of that next level. So there's that circle that heard it from Jesus directly, and then they went out, and others heard it from them. He's on that second layer. So that's what we can deduce. Okay? He numbered himself among those who had heard the gospel from those who heard it from Jesus directly, verses uh, chapter 2 verses 3 or 4. In other words, the writer of Hebrews heard the gospel from one of Jesus' personal disciples. And I'm thinking about just a really loose analogy. You probably have it, but just in case you don't. Your trustworthy older sister, if you have one, tells you that your parents went to the grocery store 30 minutes ago to get some food. Does that make sense? You're hearing it from your sister from, who heard it firsthand. That's where he's at. Okay? Go to Hebrews 2, verse 3. Hebrews 2, verse 3. 
which really means he was very close to Jesus himself, right? One generation of communication, so to speak, away. Hebrews 2, verse 3, he says, How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, so that's Jesus, and it was attested to us by those who heard. There's your second hand. You see the second layer there? So again, it was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us, those in the second ring, if you would, by those who heard directly. Okay? While God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts, of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. So, the writer counts himself among those with so-called, quote, second-hand knowledge, okay? Second layer. I hate to use the word second-hand knowledge because you know how in our world, it's, that's a negative thing. Oh, that's second-hand knowledge. You can't trust it. In our word, world, it's not a good thing. But here, it's actually... A very good thing, given first-hand knowledge was given to the apostles who would be trustworthy conveyors of truth, etc. Okay? So being that close to the Lord in terms of communication is actually a very good thing. Okay? But that's where he was. That's where this writer was, so that second level out. So we know that the writer was a man familiar with his audience. We saw that. We know that he was very close to Paul and his circle of friends who had heard the gospel directly from the Lord. Again, the point of the board is he was part of what we might effectively call the Pauline circle, okay? who numbered himself among those who had heard the gospel from those who heard it from Jesus directly. Okay? Now, one of the distinguishing features of Hebrews is that it was written with exceptional skill. We'll see this as we continue to study this out as well. If you read the book of Hebrews, and you may not see it quite as much, but in the Greek, in the original, he has an exceptional breadth of language, of vocabulary in the original Greek that actually is superior to other writers in the Bible. Again, we may not necessarily see that, we can see elements of it, as we'll see in a moment, of imagery and stuff like that, where it takes a certain type of mind to be able to use effectively an, an analogy, let's say, to something else completely unrelated. You see it more when you go into the original. I'm not going to take you to the original. You'll just have to, you know, I guess take my word for it. Um, but he has an exceptional vocabulary, even at, at, at that level, that is superior to other writers in the Bible. And he has exceptional skill, even as in what we would call rhetoric or um, you know, literary writing skills and, and making arguments and driving arguments home and, 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 and being just a good teacher, even. Uh, there's a lot of skill um, required to do a good job teaching, if you've ever taught in the past. Um, that's why if you've ever been a school, I mean, think about it. Tammy has a master's degree and she teaches first grade. And master's degrees now are actually mandated to teach elementary school. If you go to college, the, the people have PhDs, but yet they're teaching freshmen who are fresh out of high school, you know, the basics of prose or the basics of, of math. And, but yet these people are in like, you know, way out there in terms of in intelligence. Why? Because it takes a certain mastery over something to teach it down here. Does that make sense? Anybody, anybody know who uh, Mark Twain is, right? You ever, you ever heard the old saying, he said, I would, have, I would have written you a shorter letter, but I didn't have enough time. What does that mean? Think about that. That's, mastery is... <laughs> It, anyways, I'm digressing, but you get the point. The point is that the writer of Hebrews uh, had exceptional skill, and it's manifest in his writing. The writer was very intelligent and well-read, 
as seen in his writing style and his vast vocabulary. Theologians agree that the language used in Hebrews is the finest in the New Testament. The finest. That means top of the heap in terms of language, literary, hortatory uh, prowess, if you want to call it that. This is at the top. So very skilled individual, uh, steeped and understood, and understood uh, Jewish religion deeply, um, as we'll see. So just as a side note, Paul, for example, did not write like this. If you compare Hebrews against, say, a letter from Paul, they're different. Hebrews is lofty. Paul is sort of just gritty, right? Um, in fact, according to Paul's own writing, he refrained from such things on purpose. And just as a little side note, I was thinking about, you know, why maybe that was the case, because br- Paul was certainly brilliant. Paul's ministry was primarily to Gentiles who would have been uneducated in many ways relative or compared to the Hebrews, right, or the Jews. Hebrews was written to Jews. Just as a side note, up here on the board, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 1, And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. So Paul specifically wrote to his audience, his plural, wrote his letters without lofty language. That's not the case with Hebrews. It's not unattainable, but the writer wrote at a much higher level, which implies something. You're not going to speak to someone up here if they're not capable of understanding it. Is that fair? So that immediately says, well, why would he do such a thing? Well, because the audience was capable. I can't tell you how many times um, people have been honest enough. They've come to this church, and because you all are sort of advanced, I use a certain level of vocabulary, a certain level of, let's say, understanding that you know all this stuff here, and I can speak here. There are people that come here fresh, and they're like, whoa, I don't know what you're talking about. And so they don't stick around, or if they're meant to be here, they stick around, they grit it out like some of you have, and they come up to speed. But I I have to teach to the middle. And the middle of this particular congregation is a lot higher than the average congregation, especially in this area. Right? So maybe that's what was going on with Paul with the Gentiles. He said, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. There's more going on there, but you get the point. The point here is that one of the key factors in establishing that the writer of Hebrews was not Paul, even, is the writing style he used. It wasn't necessarily Paul's ministry, per se. Up here on the board, the writer of Hebrews... He wrote distinctly different than Paul, using imagery alien to Paul. Paul had his own style. If you read an epistle from Paul and then you read the book of Hebrews, you go, those aren't the same people. Just like if you were to read one of my blogs versus somebody else who writes a blog, let's say. You could tell right away that's not the same person. They have a certain style. Everybody has their own certain style. You lean towards your own experiences. You use imagery and and, and analogs that you're familiar with. Again, he wrote distinctly different than Paul, using imagery alien to Paul. Go to Hebrews 2, verse 1. Hebrews 2, verse 1. We'll see some of this. Again, we're just trying to figure out who the writer of Hebrews was. Hebrews 2, 1. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard lest we drift away from it. Drift away from it. This imagery is of a ship missing the harbor, which is a nautical connotation, of course. A nautical connotation, of course. Let's look at a 
popular passage now. Go to Hebrews 4.12. Hebrews 4.12. So that was Hebrews 2.1, where we saw a nautical, or nautical imagery, if you would. Hebrews 4.12. For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So the writer here uses the Roman sword analogy to make his point. Now, is that not a phenomenal analogy? Of course it is. But you can't do that unless you, are, unless you have the mental ability to do that. Unless you're able to see, okay, so here's something completely unrelated. Here's the truth. I want to make this, the point of this truth clearer by using something completely unrelated. You know what? That's a skill. Believe it or not, that's a skill set. Right? And so here he is using the Roman sword analogy to make his point. And he uses it quite effectively to illustrate the abilities of the Word of God to cut to the bone, even so far as the separation of soul and spirit, leaving nothing to chance in God's eyes. So in my head, when I think of this analogy, I just think of that Roman sword, right? It just cuts it wide open. And now everything's laid bare. Any kind of defense mechanism or shield you had up or attempt to sort of what the truth coming in and, and you, know, sh you know, opening up the, the, the closet full of bones and all that kind of stuff, that gets, just gets cut right through. And so this analogy is beautiful. It's perfect. It's great. But it takes a certain intellect to be able to pull it off, you see, right? Now, no offense against Paul because he's got his own effective methods. But again, back to the point we're making that this is not Paul. Paul doesn't use the same type of imagery in his writing. This is sort of next level, if you would. Right? Paul doesn't use this same type of imagery in his writing. The master, of course, would be Jesus. I mean, and who had, well, that makes sense, right? Because who would have had greater mastery over the gospel than Jesus? So his parables are so beautiful. It's, they're so simple, but yet perfect. But anyways, Paul doesn't use the same type of imagery in his writing. The implications are that this writer is, is, is well-versed in myriad topics and intelligent. He was also adept at using an agricultural or agricultural imagery. Go to Hebrews 6, verse 7. Hebrews 6, verse 7. Not everybody can do this, right? That's the point. Hebrews 6, verse 7. For land that is drunk, so you already got land in view. For land that is drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burned. So you have land, a crop, thorns and thistles, is that really what he's talking about? No. Is he talking about land and crops and thorns and thistles? No. He's trying to make a theological statement, but he's using this analogy very well to do it. And that's hard. That's a loftier type of teaching, right? It takes a certain mastery to teach that way even. So the writer uses crop imagery to differentiate between godly fruit and useless fruit. One last example of the writer's distinctive use of imagery in this book. Go to Hebrews 6.19, just around the corner. 6.19, okay? He wrote, We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain, where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So in verse 19, we have this imagery of the anchor of the soul. 
Once again, the writer uses nautical imagery to make his point. This time he uses the image of a boat anchor gripping the seabed to establish the firmness of our hope in Christ. Okay, so you can imagine an anchor gets thrown out. What does that do for a boat? It keeps it right in place. What is an anchor then if the boat becomes our hope? Our hope goes nowhere, right? An anchor, if you would. Verse 20 is a good lead into our next point regarding the writer of Hebrews, but we'll get there. For the next point, again, the point on the board is he wrote distinct, distinctively different than Paul using imagery alien to Paul. Paul did not use this kind of imagery, per se. As I alluded to earlier, um, our next point helps us understand a bit more about the perspective the writer had and used with his audience up here on the board. The writer of Hebrews, again, we're just establishing who is this person. That's going to give us context. He leaned heavily on Hellenistic Jewish cultic perspective. Now, I've got to give you a couple of little disclaimers here in a moment on words I'm using. He leaned heavily on Hellenistic Jewish cultic perspective to relate to his audience. And particularly in this book, you see an awful lot said about the priesthood of Christ and the sacrifice of Christ. But he does that by using Jewish understanding of priesthood and sacrifice. So he, he goes back to the Old Testament and says, do you know what you know about priesthood and sacrifices, Old Testament rituals, etc., etc., like that, right? He goes, oh, this is why. This is why you should have this sure hope in Jesus Christ because he is the high priest, right? He is the Lamb of God. So this is, this, this is what he uses. He can lean heavily on their own understanding. These, what we would call here, Hellenistic, Jewish, cultic perspective, okay? Now, as a side note, I need to give you a working definition of that word that I'll be using in the series uh, up here on the board. Some of you are like, wait a minute, I don't like that word cult. It makes it sound like you're saying that, you know, it's the occult or this, this cult in a negative sense. But cult doesn't always mean its most common usage, okay? So when I talk about a cult here, I'm using the third, I think there's five. I looked it up in Merriam-Webster. Uh, Merriam um, there's like five different um, definitions for cult. And the third one is a system of religious beliefs and ritual. Also, its body of adherence, right? So the cult of Apollo. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's evil. Fundamentally speaking, it's not evil in itself just because it's cultic. Cultic just really means that there's a certain religion to it. There's a certain set of practices that go along with it. There's a certain perspective to it. There's a certain rituals that go with it. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's not, there's not a negative or a positive spin here. It's just a word, the way that it's being used here. So I'll use words like cult or cultic or cultish, etc., to describe the Jewish cult. Now, I don't want you to think, oh, are you talking about like cult? You know, like, you know, they're doing sacrifices in woods and stuff like that with funny triangles and stuff. No, 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 no. It's just, use it. I'm using it extremely generically, okay? Jewish cult, okay? So I'll use words like cult, cultic, cultish to describe the Jewish cult, which included religious ordinances, you know, synagogue practices, temple worship practices, and so on. That's all I'm saying, okay? I'm using it very generically here, okay? I'm not calling Judaism a cult, per se. Okay? I'm not using the word in a negative sense here. So, I'm going to pick up more of this as we continue to read Hebrews. But again, here's a quick teaser trailer. Let's look at the second part of the passage we just read, since we're already there. Again, it said in verse 19, we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, that was the imagery that we used in the last principle that I put on the board. A hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain 
and now verse 20, where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Okay? Now, I'd never ask you to raise your hands in public, so I'm not here, so don't raise your hand. Okay? But maybe in your own mind, if I were to ask you right now to write a paragraph on Melchizedek, would you be able to? Most of you are like, I don't, I could probably, maybe you couldn't even spell it. Right? Is that fair? All right. So, or maybe a simpler task. If I were to ask you to write a paragraph on what a high priest was during this time in human history, would you be able to? And some of you are probably like, probably not. I could maybe get close. I could maybe talk about a little bit what I think it is. But at the end of the day, I probably wouldn't do A-level work. Now, I'm not trying to say anyone here is uneducated. I'm really not. It has nothing to do with that. What I'm pointing out is that the audience... Now, think about what we're trying to get to here with this book. The audience that this writer was commuting to, communicating to would have known would have understood, right, what a high priest was for sure, and likely would have known about Melchizedek too. So we're trying to transport ourselves back to the writer and how matter-of-factly he wrote to this audience. Do you understand what I'm getting at? The, high, the idea of a high priest to this audience would have been like, oh yeah, I know what that is. It would have been just as easy, like if someone said to you, What's a pastor? And from your experience in this church, you'd be able to at least write a paragraph. Right? You'd say, well, he does this, and this is his responsibilities, and he ta- you know, he's a shepherd, he's a pastor, he yada yada, he studies, he teaches the word of God, he, he consults when necessary, you know, this whole thing, right? You could write easily about me. But if I was to ask you to write about a high priest, you'd be like, ah. So just turn the tables. From their perspective, They would have been just as comfortable as you are with me as with a high priest for them. So that's, you have to understand this. You want to understand the context. He writes very matter-of-factly, very freely about high priest, even Melchizedek. Okay? So again, they would have known what a high priest was for sure and likely would have known about Melchizedek too. In other words... As we establish a solid picture of the writer, we must understand the context, the context of his writing. In this case, part of the context is that he used the Jewish cultic perspective to make his points. These people would have immediately understood the Jewish cultic perspective. And all I mean by cultic is all the religious practices and the rituals and the sacrifices and the priests that went about performing some of the things, say, in the temple. That's all. And that would have been normal for them. They would have immediately understood it. And so he leans on that. He leans on that understanding that they had, like any good teacher would. Right? I'm not going to keep teaching you all the exact same thing day in and day out. You'd be like, come on, man, we already know that stuff. Let's move on. Same thing. That's the context. He used the Jewish cultic perspective, their perspective during that time, to make his points. So you have to think about how steeped they all were in Judaism, its religious rituals, its ordinances, its practices, etc. Okay? So even though it might be a little confusing for you, it wasn't for them. These things would have been second nature to them and common knowledge because they would have grown up around it. You understand? It would have been part of their society. And they were, by the way, they were a lot less distracted than today. This society back then, the religion, you know, the synagogue, the temple, all that kind of stuff, that would have been like front and center. It would have been like just part of life, you know? Um, some of you... I don't know, I'm just, I was just thinking out loud, maybe some ex-Catholics in here, that kind of thing. 
you maybe could relate a little bit. If someone asked you, you know, what's the, what is a priest in there, you might have an idea, of, you know, this kind of a thing. How do you do church in the Catholic church? You probably, oh, well, we do this and we do that and we do this. And if I use that language with you, you immediately know what I was talking about. Fair enough? Same thing, because that would have been something you were steeped in. So, as we'll continue to see throughout Hebrews, the author, or the writer, see, I screwed up, see that? The writer leans very heavily on this method of using the Jewish cultic perspective. And so you have to get yourself in that mode of thinking. You have to say, okay, I'm going to put myself in their shoes. Okay? We see evidence of this as the writer continued to make his case through Melchizedek. Go to Hebrews 7.11. Hebrews 7.11. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek rather than one named after the order of Aaron? Okay? Now remember, you're probably saying, man, that's a lot there. I don't really completely understand what he's trying to say there because I don't have the same Jewish cultic perspective as that particular audience had. And that's okay. Honestly, be okay with it. Right? We're just trying to get there. That's all. And we'll get there, I promise. We'll get there. And when we get there, you're going to be like, oh, man, I love this book now. Because now you're going to understand the perspective, the context of the book. And then it's going to be like, oh, wow, that makes total sense. Right? So we'll get back to the specifics here. All we're trying to establish at the moment is who is the writer and what do we know about him? Who is the writer and what do we know about him? That's all we're doing right now. All those specifics, leave them aside for now. What can you pull out when you're looking for who is the writer and what do we know about him? So we'll be spending more time specifically on the priesthood of Christ later when that comes up as a specific topic. For now, we can say that the writer used Hellenistic Jewish perspective with his audience. Okay? And just as a side note, you've heard me use the word a couple of times now up here on the board. Excuse me. Hellenistic just means refers to the spread of Greek culture that had begun after the conquest of Alexander the Great in the fourth century before Christ BC. Okay, so this was a type of let's call it a Gentile culture that existed that pre-existed the incarnation of Christ. And so then, when Judaism and Hellenism came together, when the gospel started to spread this way, these two merged. So you have this idea of Hellenistic Judaism. Okay? As you can imagine, what did, how did Judaism proper land in Hellenistic society how, once it started to infuse? And then when Christ came along, Hellenistic Jewish Christians. right? And that's a good thing to think about because you say, it's real. right? You understand the history of how people got to be a Hellenistic Jewish Christian. And it's important because you understand that they were influenced by Gentile, by Hellenistic culture, by Judaism, Jewish, and by Christ himself. And so you have to say, okay, so this sort of, I hate to use a big word, but an amalgamation, right? A coming together, a synthesis, if you would, of all these cultic realities, you understand? I can, I'll tell you what, I, I'm going to say this out loud, and you can hate me for it, but it doesn't matter. But I'd be willing to bet if I sat down with every one of you for five minutes, I would know whether you were an ex-Catholic or not, even now. And you might say, well, how would you know? You just asked me the question. Nope, I wouldn't have to ask you the question. I would just have to poke and prod a little bit, and if a little bit of that old religion came out in you, which it would eventually, I'd say you're an ex-Catholic, aren't you? And you said, darn it, I am. Right? And Because you, you still have that little remnant. You can see people when they come through these doors and they're brand new. Right? And then you talk to them briefly. It's like, okay, so you're an ex-whatever, right? 
You're a, you, you never went anywhere before this, did you? Nope. Well, welcome. You're an ex-Catholic? I can tell. Welcome. I'm not saying he's right or wrong about any of that. But you get my point, right? You can see that people are this melting pot of all their previous experiences. You don't just leave stuff at the door when you come through this door. You don't magically all of a sudden become 100% orthodox to biblical truth. You're all dragging around religion. You're all dragging around preconceptions about what, who you thought God was, who you thought the Lord was. You're still dragging that stuff around. That's why you get haunted by it. That's why you're not completely sanctified yet. That's not why you're delivered yet. It's because you're still hanging on to old religious practices. Old things that you learned even from your last religion that wasn't Catholicism. I've seen that in this congregation. People use certain language and certain doctrines come up. And I say, oh, I know where that came from. <laughs> we'll get that out of there eventually because that's a disease. Right? But you can see it. Does everybody understand what I'm getting at? I know. What? Everybody? Can I get a couple of nods? Thank you. Thank you. This isn't hard, right? This is just us finding out who's the writer. And we have to understand Hellenistic, Jewish, Christian, or Christianity. Okay? That existed back then. Again, uh, that shows this, the priesthood aspect of the writer's Hellenistic Jewish perspective. And that, given his frequent and matter-of-fact usage of cultic concepts, we may also begin to conclude that this, his audience would have uh, been steeped in the same perspective. Right? Unless he just wanted to blow over the top of everyone's heads, which would have no fruit whatsoever. The implication is if he was using this kind of language, they would have at least understood it. Okay? Again, up here on the board, he leaned heavily on Hellenistic Jewish cultic perspective to relate to his audience. And we're going to see a lot of that when we study out priesthood and sacrifices in this book. Okay? He spends a fair amount of time on those things, and he just assumes that his audience understands uh, what he's talking about. All right? So we just saw a quick reference to the priesthood the writer's audience would have had knowledge of. Let's take a quick look at another passage to establish the writer's cultic references to sacrifices. Go to Hebrews 9.23. Hebrews 9, verse 23. Again, we're just trying to figure out, who was this guy that wrote this book? Hebrews 9, 23. Thus, it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself. Now to appear. And he's talking about temple stuff, right? Where priests went in and made sacrifices, this kind of a thing, right? But into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Hmm. So you can, as you can clearly see, the writer wrote to his audience with the underlying presumption. Remember their posture. They would have been like, well, we know Judaism. And we know what the temple's about. We know the Day of Atonement. And we know the high priest goes in there past the curtain and does all, you know. We know about sacrifices. We know about rituals. Okay? He would have used that posture of his audience to teach. Right? So the writer wrote to his audience with the underlying presumption that they would understand fundamental teachings about Jewish cultic rituals and such. All of that that we just read, they would have understood. I'm following, I'm following. Oh, that's just a type? That was just a shadow? Yeah, 
All those things, they were just shadows of things to come. Right? And they had to do it over and over because it never really cleared our conscience. We'll get out to all that. But you see the point. The basic assumption by the writer is that he could presume that they understood what he was talking about. Just fundamentally. As a matter of fact, as he was talking, as he was writing this, and remember this was meant to be heard. Okay? So again, clearly seen, the writer wrote to his audience with the underlying presumption that they would understand fundamental teachings about Jewish cultic rituals and such, specifically rituals of sacrifice and the fact that Say blood was required for a reason. Again, the point of the board is he leaned heavily on Hellenistic Jewish perspective to relate to his audience. And we're going to see a ton of that when we get into the book itself and, we, and the priesthood starts coming up, right? We saw a little bit of that with the reference to Melchizedek, but we just saw a little bit more. Um, and then sacrifices. This would have all made sense to them. That would have been the connective tissue, which is beautiful. And this is a good place to stop now, I think, because at the top of the hour, given what we have garnered, or that we have garnered a good picture of who the writer of Hebrews was. So I just want to summarize, just sit back. You can close your Bibles, right? Relax. Close your Bibles. Tammy. I'm just kidding. Just summarize. All right, first one. Who wrote the book of Hebrews? There's no consensus among theologians on who wrote the book of Hebrews. In antiquity, arguments were made for Paul, Barnabas, Luke, and Clement of Rome. In recent times, Apollo, Silvanus, Philip the deacon, Priscilla, Aquila, Jude, Aristion, and others have been suggested. The writer is anonymous because we don't have enough evidence to dogmatically support any one candidate. That we know. Next slide. He was known to his audience, and he was a man. He was known to his audience. That means he had a relationship with them, some level of intimacy, and he was a man. Next slide. He was part of what we might effectively call the Pauline circle, and a certain group of people going out there who numbered himself among those who had heard the gospel from those who heard it from Jesus directly. He was sort of the next level out, still very close to the atomic center, which would have been Jesus Christ. Still very close, but next level out. Next slide. He wrote distinctly different than Paul, using imagery alien to Paul. He was a very uh, educated, lofty writer. He would have been a very religious person, right? By the use of his language and by the use of his mastery, over even Judaism, Judaistic practices, right, the, Jew, the Jewish cult. He also had a mastery over all of these things, and he used them very effectively. But he was, also, he was also very intelligent, being able to bring in things like, you know, nautical and agricultural and even, you know, Roman-type uh, analogies into play. He had a vast vocabulary. So this book is really up here from a literary sense. Uh, and then uh, finally, he leaned heavily on Hellenistic Jewish cultic perspective to relate to his audience. Right? To relate to his audience. And I, I just did that earlier. Right? I would probably cover 90% or more of this congregation if I just say I'm an ex-Catholic who was also a hyperdoctrinal idiot at one point. That probably covers everybody in here. There's probably a couple of you that never had anything going on, and that's cool. But I often use that common thread between us to teach you. Very often I use it and I depend on it to teach you certain points, right? And so in the same way, if you have that as an ability as a teacher, then it makes you a better teacher. And so he used his knowledge of his audience, understood what they understood, understood even what they knew, and he taught to that point. He taught that way. Um, that's a very powerful way to uh, teach and even preach. 
especially when you're trying to encourage a group of individuals. People, people are much more apt to be encouraged by someone that they have something in common with. Is that fair? Right? If some schmo comes off the street and says, hey, you should, you're going to be like, dude, get away from me. Right? But if, let's just say, say uh, you're a recovering addict and the person you're talking to is a recovering addict, guess what? The next thing you know, you're more likely to listen to them because they can relate to you. Does that make sense? Right? And so a good teacher will always use that ability to relate to their audience whenever possible to get the job done. You have to get the job done. And so that's what we're seeing here. I understand you guys. I understand you all. Let me encourage you. Don't lose your first love. Do you remember where you were? Let's not go backwards. Remember at the beginning of this series, it was him trying to say, okay, so I, I'm looking at this church. I'm just saying. I'm looking at this congregation. It's starting to shift. It's starting to lose his first love. He's trying to encourage the congregation back. And he's using the stuff that they know. He's using elements of what their own understanding uh, from a, a Jewish cultic perspective is. He's using all of that, going all the way back to Old Testament Scripture to encourage that progress back towards the Lord. And that's what we see here. So you see a man doing the best he can for a congregation that needs encouragement. Does that make sense? Okay. So next Sunday we'll look at um, the writer's audience in Hebrews. Okay? Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the privilege of being here this morning together as family to study your word. It's beautiful. It's unbelievable. Father, we're just so grateful for your patience with us as we continue to learn and grow up. We ask this in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Amen.